I think this is a really important part of a lot of the projects we do is the monitoring and maintenance. So we'll go ahead and kick it off to Sean and Jeremy to wrap us up here. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, definitely monitoring and maintenance is something that that we should be paying attention to and and especially maybe with these structures. Next. So we have a couple different types of monitoring that we do on these structures. And the first one is really this, this structure performance. This idea about did the structure do what we thought it was going to do, what we designed it to do? Um, is it the right size? What happened when the water hit it? Um, so structure performance. Um, and this is an important point that we should all really listen to that Z-Dyke techniques are really designed to make gradual improvements through time. So we talked about this, that this isn't a, a quick fix. It's not the easy button. We're not, we're not trying to, to fill up the, the channel all at once. Um, and so this really structures should be monitored. Um, so Bill's techniques are, are ones that you want to go back and look, especially the first year of runoff. So what, what did the first runoff event do to your structure? Um, and really this idea about long-term commitment. So this isn't really one and done. You know, you want to build some stuff, go back the first year after runoff. Um, maybe it worked exactly like you thought. Um, maybe there's a couple rocks that, that fell out or, or need to be replaced. Um, maybe the water went around one side and you need to extend it, you know, a little bit on valley left or something. But this idea that, uh, you know, you're going back uh, maybe the first, especially the first year, but maybe a couple years after and just making sure things are working. Um, and so this is a little different from other techniques um, in that regard. But after about, you know, year two or three, everything starts to grow in. Everything's really kind of seated and well set. Um, after then, I think you can think you're pretty good. Next. So it's kind of a fun time to go look at what you've done. Um, we did a little bit of this uh, on Monday. Got to look at some some work that had been done in Emma Park, Jeff, last year. And man, it looked amazing. And to see, to see these structures with water running through them, um, is just really gratifying, exciting. Also, you know, this sediment capture, you know, seeing how much sediment did you gain? Um, of course, we've got some grouse tracks in our sediment here. We've got some vegetation that's pioneering in on this new vegetation. Um, so monitoring can be, can be fun too, but monitoring that structure performance is important. Next. So sometimes, yeah, Sometimes stuff happens, you know, we got a big flood event, like a week and a half after we installed these two structures here. Um, you can see on the one on the left, that used to be a one rock dam um, and the water just sheared off uh, the main part of the, the one rock dam here. And this fancy thing in the lower right, that looks like a pile of rock. It is a pile of rock in the creek. It's just a point bar at this point. And that was some kind of zuni bowl that we had put in. Um, we got this huge flood. It was kind of on a corner and it just, it washed the whole structure apart. Um, so this is, I could say this is fairly rare. You know, we don't have a lot of this sort of catastrophic stuff happen. If we're building things correctly and in the right places, uh, we don't see a lot of this. Um, but it does happen sometimes, especially if you get a big flood event right after construction, stuff hasn't had a chance to, to kind of grow in and seed itself. Um, but structure maintenance, checking to see, did it work? Um, are things working the way we thought? Next. And then monitoring, you know, it gives you the opportunity to, to say, wow, this structure works so well that we're actually, we're ready for another layer. So this is part of the beauty of Bill's work is that we talked about earlier, you know, this structure on the left, this is a one rock dam that has totally filled to the top with sediment. Like it's it's done, it's done its purpose. Um, it was a foot tall 
and it's stacked a foot of sediment in behind it, um, it can't it can't trap any more sediment. And so Bill would say in his incremental approach, his modest approach to this type of work is now's the time to go in and build another layer. So build another layer on top of this, another foot layer, another one rock dam on top of this and capture another foot of sediment. But we're doing it incrementally over time, really. If instead of going in with a two foot tall structure that the water laughs at you and goes around, you build two one rock dams that one foot tall, um, maybe I think this was four years apart. Um, and so this monitoring can can reveal, you know, how successful were the structures and inform, you know, is there more work that can be done there? Next. Then there's this other type of monitoring. So we just went over like structure performance monitoring. We call this kind of monitoring the sort of outcome-based monitoring. And in the Gunnison Basin, um, we use vegetation really as a surrogate for our success. And so this is Renee Rondeau's work from the Colorado Natural Heritage Program. She's an amazing ecologist who started in 2009 with this project and has been working on it ever since. Um, she's, she's come out with a paper just recently that's been submitted um, hasn't been accepted yet, but this is her work. And it's really about, you know, can we monitor the vegetation um, as a result of our, our structures and, and what they're doing? And there, Jeremy went over this a little bit before with the NDBI, the, the satellite-based remote sensing um, that shows that these structures are, are ultimately increasing the productivity of these sites. But this, these are where her goals, uh, they increase the mesic meadow resilience. Um, especially in the face of, of climate change and extreme drought events. And so to increase average cover of, of sedges, rushes, willows, and wetlands, and to decrease uplands. Next. And so these are line point intercept transects. Some of you are familiar with that type of work. Um, and she's got some amazing data uh, that's going to be coming out. But the, so she had controls and treated areas, and you can see some of the results here. Um, she found that it generally five years is, is when a site, you know, re really has had a chance to respond. Um, uh, some, some sites respond right away, but in general, I think she was finding that, that maybe five years is when you get the most response showing. Next. So another style of monitoring that we use a lot is just photo points, right? These are super easy to use um, or to do. R Renee is super militant about her return photos. There's definitely a way to do these. You'll notice, you know, skyline's the same. It's all, she tries to take it on the same day every year. Um, you even have to wear the same hat, you know, if you're in the photo, stuff like that. But so photo points can be super uh, revealing about what is happening as a result of your, your work. So in 2012, they installed this media luna to spread water back out from a channelized situation. Um, the water was just channelized going through this meadow. And so you can see the results, you know, in one year, two years later, um, pretty amazing. And so she has all this data about, um, you know, that the, the sedges increased, the Canada thistle finally got excluded, it got too wet. So photo points can be a great way and a cheap um, sort of cost-effective way um, to monitor your site about what's the outcome of what you've done. Next. You know, some other things that we're exper uh, experimenting with is really this idea about soil moisture, maybe. Um, so using, you know, various techniques. Uh, this is Andrew Brebart from the from the BLM. He's with the Forest Service now, but he was the hydrologist in Gunnison for over a decade. Um, and he's collaborated with, with universities and um, students to come out and do projects on our, on our uh, areas. Um, and he's used a variety of techniques. So controls and and uh, treated areas, 
but looking at soil moisture and um, measuring precip, soil moisture, trying to figure out what kinds of effects were happening um, underneath in the soil as a result of our, our treatment. So this can be another idea about what are you monitoring. Um, this is a good one. Next. Mm. Yeah, okay. That's the goal, increase soil moisture, you betcha. Thank you, next. Camera traps too, you know, everybody's got their uh, Reconyx cameras these days. Um, these can be pretty powerful too, you know, for showing how are these areas being used. And, you know, this is some work from, from Colorado Parks and Wildlife, Nate Seward. Um, he's really trying to, to look at, are we having an effect on sage grouse, Gunnison sage grouse specifically? So he's got control points and, and treated areas. Camera traps can, can be really fun to show you who's using, who's using these areas, um, what kind of effect you might be having on, on wildlife or, or other. So that's outcome-based monitoring. Again, some camera traps. Next. And Jeremy, you were going to talk a little bit about this. Yeah, well, you know, you're the field guy, so you get to talk about all the fun stuff. I just <laughs> got to talk about the desktop uh, remote, <laughs> remotely sensed data sets. But we do have, you know, um, existing data sets, especially when your meadows are a little bit larger. Uh, you can get some of that picked up with land, Landsat derived remotely sensed vegetation maps. Um, one of those products is called the Rangeland Analysis Platform or RAP. You can find it at rangelands.app. Uh, but this application covers the entire US, uh, every square inch at a 30 meter resolution and provides um, functional group data on like vegetation from perennial grasses to trees and shrubs. Um, but probably most importantly from a meadow standpoint is like biomass. So we actually have estimates of per perennial and annual herbaceous biomass every 16 days and cumul cumulatively across the year. So um, when we talk about this, you know, soil moisture, productivity, resilience concept, you can actually start to measure that with data. Uh, taken from satellites in space. And so I'd encourage you to check that out. This product's now under the stewardship of um, USDA's Ag Research Station down there in Hornada. So we've got some great scientists down there uh, helping to lead this project now. Next. This is an example. This, this is a project a friend of mine did here in Central Oregon, more of kind of the larger project area is some Tonka toy work in this stream, but you've got your digitized polygon of your valley bottom before the project took place and after. And of course, it's cool to be able to see the landscape get greener and all of these pixels, but you also have the data. So that chart right there kind of depicts um, the biomass and the you know, the green and the blue are kind of the perennial and herbaceous or total herbaceous biomass post project is going up and to the right. So we're, we're getting this great bump in production pounds per acre that, you know, is really important uh, currency in our working landscapes as we talk about why this is important and why producers might want to get on board with it. Um, so with that, I think we're kind of to the end of our whole workshop here. Um, we're going to bring Eric back up and, and I guess have a, a broad discussion with any final questions or, you know, all of the panelists and presenters coming up here. Yeah, so <clears throat> we'd encourage you to just, if you have any other questions, I have a couple that have been sent in that we'll <clears throat> touch on first. And so I don't forget before we go, watch your email in the next week or so. We're going to kind of send a follow up that will include <clears throat> all the Q&A with all the questions. Um, and all the answers written out from the different presenters. Uh, we'll also have a survey uh, just to make sure how this was received and see if there's holes in what we presented to make sure you got the whole picture. Um, 
And then there'll also be, you know, a lot of the links and different things that were um, given in the chat. So we'll hopefully give you all the resources with, that were talked about uh, today. Um, also props to the, the wrap tool that Jeremy's shop there at Working Lands came up with. I use it a ton in my current job, especially with the drought the last few years, it's a really good way to look at your landscape. So, all right, so let me start with throwing a couple of questions out there that were left over. And then, you know, again, feel free to, this is your chance to kind of catch up on anything that you might have questions about. So uh, Rose Smith had asked if there's a database example or a database with different examples of projects to look at to kind of get an idea of, of what is possible. Uh, I think maybe Dan and some of the others can help us out in WRI, the Watershed Restoration Initiative database. There may be some of those. Is that fair, Stan, Dan, Clint? I assume some of these have been funded through WRI. Jim shaking his head. So that's one place. Yeah. Jeremy, are there other places that they can go to, to kind of get an ex uh, some examples of projects that have been done? Yeah, you know, this is a, a perennial problem and one that I get my feet held to the fire over because we've been running around the West getting people all fired up. They go off and they do this stuff and it doesn't take a bunch of money. And so there aren't all these like huge federal contracts you can track back and say that's where that's happening. But I can tell you, there's pictures all over the place. There's people doing it. It's happening. It's a frustration for a lot of us uh, who are trying to network and connect everyone. But I will drop a link into the into the chat. There's a um, Joe Wheaton's group uh, did a project funded through Oregon, but it's Westwide. It's called the Low Tech Process Based Restoration Explorer. It's a website with a map that you can enter your projects in, and you can see other people's projects. And so, if you're inclined to do so, I'd encourage you to check that out. Contact the people in your your area that you're interested in those project details or um, even consider adding your own projects so that others can kind of learn from you as well. But um, there's definitely a lot happening across, across the entire West. It's just not well tracked. So Rose, this is something that Clint and I and the Utah partners have talked about quite a bit, trying to encourage as much of this work to happen um, in the near future. So I'm gonna throw everybody kind of under the bus collectively if you'll reach out to us, those of us that have kind of helped put this together, um, you know, would be willing to come out, maybe even walk your piece of ground with you to make sure, to give you some ideas of what's possible, what's not possible. Um, again, recognizing the need sometimes to kind of help people get started. So um, look for that. We'll try to put something together a little more formal in the future. That's our plan is to kind of create a nexus here locally to help with some of that because I know just having Sean and Jeremy come out and spend a day with us made a huge difference for us just having somebody that's been through a bunch of these so we'll, we'll try to replicate that a little bit but thanks for the heads up on that other database Jeremy um, one of the other questions this kind of probably goes back to Sean specific to one of those last uh structures you showed it said when building the second layer so this is the one that I think filled up with sediment sediment <clears throat> they want to know once you fill that up would you want to move that next structure upstream just a little bit to give your water kind of a stair step down or do you build it exactly on top of the existing structure that's filled with sediment yeah great question um and you're correct the first one so you do move it back um a little bit and you actually use the first structure as your splash apron or your you know your splash pad so so Typically, we go to the middle of the first structure and start building a second layer there. Um, and so it'll take a little bit more rock because you're higher up in the channel, which makes it wider. You know, you're going to have to go from side to side. So a little bit more rock to do that second layer, but definitely step it back and use that first layer as your, your splash apron. Yep. Awesome. Kind of along the same lines, again, from Scott Chamberlain, what's the maximum stream, stream order on which these techniques have been installed? So I, I think how much how much stream can you handle with these type of techniques? How much water flow? I think that's what Scott is asking. Mm. 
Yeah, that's a tough one to answer. Um, I know that we've, we've worked in some really big drainages, but it matters if it's like, if you're dealing with sheet flow, um, you can do a lot. If you've already got a channel and water's really rushing, um, you, you might want to be a little bit more modest there. Um, but typically these structures here, you know, kind of an interesting divide here is that the BDAs and the woodwork um, really more popular, more useful in perennial systems. And so this stuff we're talking about is, is mostly ephemeral systems. Um, so not perennial water generally, maybe some spring fed stuff a little bit. So not a ton of water. Um, so that might be kind of a cutoff, Scott, that you could think about a little bit there, perennial versus ephemeral. Um, but again, with this modest approach, so not very high, um, your structures aren't, aren't super aggressive. Um, you can work in places that with that modest approach um, and, and have good, good results in, in pretty big areas. Yeah, I was just gonna add, uh, you know, for, from the NRCS standpoint, we had a lot of conversations and consternations with our engineers um, over the years on low tech work. And it, it kind of took us coming to an understanding of like, what's their concern and a lot of their job and their drive is mitigating risks and risks to life and property in particular. And so as we understood that more, we developed actually a little checklist that's it's in Joe Wheaton's PBR design manual. I'll try to drop a copy in the chat. It's a simple little red, yellow, green questionnaire that you can walk through that just says, you know, what's your stream order? If you're a, a first order headwater stream, you know, the risk is much lower, but there's a lot of other factors, you know, stream power and, and some other things there, but um, that water source, you know, how much water, is it perennial? Uh, things like that matter. The setting matters too. So if you want to put in a Zuni bowl to protect, you know, $10,000 an acre crop ground from getting eroded, I would say, don't do that. Go, go find someone to engineer a solution that will never move. If you're talking about rangeland and forest land where it's, you know, not a big concern if it continues to move and we have some erosion happen next year, that's a safe space to work and where I would just focus my efforts. So one question that just occurred to me, especially knowing some of the country that Scott works in, you know, here in Utah, especially in southern Utah, we can have some ephemeral streams that still see some tremendous volumes, you know, either during monsoon. And, you know, I guess, you know, we can't necessarily design a perfect structure every time. But is that, I mean, in your experience, Sean, have you had problems with that? Yeah, I think we have had some issues in some places, mostly with, uh, maybe water getting in behind some of our structures. Um, uh, particularly, I'm thinking of one in Northwest Colorado, really big watershed, super sandy soils, um, getting an event pretty much two weeks right after we built it. That matters too, you know, nothing really had a chance to, to seal up or, or become established. Um, and so, I think, yeah, maybe use some caution with those those really big areas, big, big chances for really big flows. Um, but again, I have seen really big flows go right over the top of all of our stuff, you know, and, and because it's only a foot tall, um, it doesn't wash away um, and still works. And so um, I, another idea is to sort of do some some pilot testing, you know, like if you have a place in mind, you know, try a few structures and see how they work. Um, that might be another idea. Don't let the flashiness of a system scare you. Every single site we've ever visited anywhere in the West, people go, you know, guys, this is really flashy system. And we're like, yeah, we know. <laughs> Everything we work in is flashy. So um, 
the modesty of your structures, the redundancy and the complexes of structures, all of those things work in your favor to ensure that you're not just betting on one big thing to work. Well, and I, I think the other point there is just <clears throat> doing nothing isn't going to get you any further along, right? So at some point, we've got to draw a light in the sand and move forward. So, okay, appreciate that. A couple of questions. Um, and this is a question I'd add, Terrell. So Terrell Thane asks, Do you, have you ever built these structures and scattered seed? I think we'd actually asked Sean that exact question. We're in the field. So Sean. Yeah. Yeah. Um... And Bill used to always use seed, you know, he would, he would seed down in New Mexico and build his structure right on it. And so, um, Gunnison Basin's a little freakier, you know, no, one of the things about such a diverse coalition is no one can agree on like a seed mix, you know, it's super contentious, you know, to have, have one seed mix. Here, That's yeah. Yeah. Here, so, so, so you guys are more reasonable. I would say if you have a chance to, to use seed, Absolutely. Because really, again, what we want to affect is those plants. And so the sooner that we get plant colonization and, and stuff growing in these structures, the better off we are. And so um, absolutely with the seed. Great question, Terrell. Uh, then one last question here from Clint Brunson. Um, and I guess it's pretty specific to Jeremy and maybe the IWJV team said it would be great to see a time lapse of building some of these structures. Do you, or do any of you have something like this, um, kind of a video as they're being built, kind of a time lapse of the structures being built? Yeah, Sean, I, I think, I'm not sure if we have time lapse, but we got, you know, Hollywood Sean Connor here. Uh, there were some really <laughs> nice videos that were put together by the Wyoming Fishing Game that I think, if I recall right, kind of walked through a little bit of the thought process in the field, but um, yeah, I, I would hear myself talk, but it, I know you do, but you're, you're really great. So I'm going to drop that in the chat, but I would highly encourage you all, if you haven't seen it done to do it and share it with us. Cause selfishly, we want to use it like that time lapse out of Wyoming. I just got from our folks up there who put it together. And so uh, we're sharing these resources that all help one another communicate uh, why we might want to do this with others. You know, Jeremy, yeah. there ahead, was a, Jim. there was a, when we did our little field trip, uh, the PR person in the Northeastern region did a time lapse of us building a rundown down one of those, the shoots going into a creek, but I'm not sure where that file ended up. You know, just one one thing I would encourage uh, Utahns to do here is can connect with one another, and hopefully um, we can share a participant list. Um, you know, with who is here, so you all can reach out and like share resources, because this type of work is collaborative. It's it's um, easy, but it's collaborative, which makes it a little more like we should share labor, share resources share ideas. Um, and so I think that's a really important part of where we've seen success after Sean and I leave and go to the next place. And that we, we have, I don't know if it's been explicitly mentioned, but you know, we used to just do these workshops in person and we'd come and teach this, this classroom material in the classroom with like 30 or 40 people. And then we'd go build stuff because that's where it really, the learning happens. But we found with, with COVID, we learned how to blend this virtual content with the field component. So now we can give you all about this much awareness for 200 people. And then there's a dedicated core here that are going to get more proficient and more confident through um, a demonstration site being set up there in Emma Park that folks could come and visit potentially and maybe see this on the ground uh, and make it more, more tangible for you. Well, and for Clint and Rose and others, our intent here that, you know, as Clint and I and the other Utah partners, Jim, the DWR folks started putting this together. Our intent was to get some demonstration, you know, some sites put in that we can use the demonstration. So we now have some scattered from Cedar City to the basin and, you know, parts in between. So hopefully over the next few years, we can use that to focus some of our WRI tours and other, you know, summer field tours 
through the various organizations to look at some of those. Because I think, at least for me, once you get out on the ground, start talking about it, looking at some structures, it becomes far less intimidating. So, hey, Eric, yep. real, real quick. Go uh, ahead, Sean. There, we do work with a, a group of volunteers here in Colorado called the Wildland Restoration Volunteers. And they did do, do a time lapse one time of us building a, a one rock dam. Um, there's a chance it's on their website, um, but it was it was fantastic. It was sort of really fast. It was one of those really fast sped up ones. Um, and the great thing was like, you could see the people building and they would try a rock and they'd throw it out. And they'd try a rock and they'd throw it out. And so all of those hands working together super fast um, can be a really neat uh, way to to understand how to build stuff. And there's a chance it's on their website. They also have a lot of pictures about work that they've done on, gosh, it's been over 10 years, I think we've been working with them. And so you can go into their pictures um, and check out structures. Maybe it's not a time lapse, but a lot of good information there, a lot of good experience. And that's the Wildland Restoration Volunteers. Yep. Lynn, I think you were saying something. I can't remember. No. Oh. <laughs> so, so again, if you look at the Utah partners that are on, you know, that were on the planning committee for this, Jim, Clint, Dan, Dana, Stan, TJ, um, these are folks that have already dipped their toe in the water, so to speak, with these structures. So don't, don't hesitate reaching out to them. Um, they can give you some pretty good guidance. And again, hopefully we'll, our plan is not to be kind of one and done. We're hoping to continue some of this to, because I think this is a tool that will be pretty applicable across quite a bit of Utah. So, all right. So if there's no other questions, any parting comments from the crew? If not, we'll shut it down and send everybody home. I just, I just want to tell everybody just not to be afraid and go out and try it. It, it'll be it'll be easier and more fun than you thought it would be and the the, the results or the outcome is really rewarding so just go out and, try and the, it. the risk of failure is low as long as you yeah. follow uh you know a little bit of thought process that we provided you with here today and planning and permitting and whatnot and uh keep this as part of your broader toolbox i mean there is this isn't just a flavor of the month this is one more thing to help you see a fuller picture on the landscape and be able to address it. But I really want to thank the Utah partners. This has been a, a year in the making and uh, the joint venture and BLM for funding support for Sean. And um, yeah, this is, it takes a team to pull something like this off. So thank you. Absolutely. I've been super impressed with this partnership and the folks in Utah um, I spent about 10 years in Utah and actually learned how to put rocks together in Utah. So it is fun to, to see all of you coming together like this. And yeah, it's, it's going to be good. So looking forward to our workshop too. Awesome. Okay, with that, we'll turn y'all loose. Thank you very much for participating. And we look forward to working with you more in the future.